video is to talk about specific heat capacity and the study of calorimetry. So before we go any further in the video, what I'd like you to do is imagine yourself on a hot summer beach, 75 degrees out, and you want to walk to the water. Well, you have to actually run to the water because the sand is so hot, it burns the bottoms of your feet. However, once you get into the water, your feet are immediately cooled off. So ask yourself this, why is it that the sand seems so much hotter than the water, even though you are all in the same 75 degree environment? So the reason for this is a scientific principle called specific heat. The specific heat of the water is higher than that of the sand which means that you need a lot more energy to heat up one kilogram of that water, one degree Celsius, than you need energy to heat up one kilogram of the sand, one degree Celsius. So from that, we can get the following definition. Specific heat is the amount of thermal energy that is needed to raise one kilogram of a substance one degree Celsius or one Kelvin. And then we have to make sure that the pressure of the surroundings and the volume always stays constant. If those change, the rule changes. Another note here is that the symbol used in this text for specific heat is lowercase c sub p. However, you're going to revisit thermal energy and specific heat in IV chemistry or another science class. So you might see it denoted with lowercase s, they mean the exact same thing. In order to find the specific heat, specific heat can be found from this equation, or we can use this equation to figure out how much heat is gained or lost by a substance. So the formula for specific heat, I kind of call it QMSAT because when I taught chemistry, I used S instead of C. And if you sound this out, it sounds like QMSAT, where the delta sounds like an A. Q is defined as the amount of heat gained or lost by a substance. M is the mass of the substance in kilograms. C sub P is the specific heat capacity of that substance, or how much energy is needed to raise one kilogram of that substance one degree Celsius or Kelvin, and delta T is the change in temperature in either Kelvins or Celsius. Here are common specific heat values. So if you notice here, scrolling down, you will see that there's a specific heat for seawater, assuming the beach we were at had salt water, and Here's the specific heat for sand. You'll see that it takes a lot less energy to heat up one kilogram of sand than it will take salt water. There are a lot of reasons for this, but the primary reason has to do with the state of matter. Metals or solids are going to have lower specific heats because the molecules are packed closer together and it's a lot easier to change that particular set of molecules kinetic energy because the molecules are so close. The further spread out molecules are, the harder it is to increase the kinetic energy of those particles. Seawater at room temperature or 75 degrees Fahrenheit is going to be a liquid, so it takes a lot more energy to heat up those molecules because they are constantly moving in a liquid form. Okay. So the next part of this video talks about calorimetry. So a calorimeter is an insulated container that is used to measure the amount of heat transferred between two substances. So the word calorimeter has the prefix calorie we know a calorie is a way to measure the amount of chemical potential energy inside of a food. Well, it's also 
a measurement of energy, just like the joule is a measurement of energy. So basically calorimeter is an instrument meter to measure energy, in this case, calories or joules. So we can think about a calorimeter as just a simple insulated container where heat can not get out or come into the system. And we can use that to study the heat transferred between two substances. In our case, the substances that we are going to use are metals to liquids or water. And we are going to use that information to figure out the specific heat of common metals. You've actually probably used a calorimeter at some point this week already because a coffee cup is a simple calorimeter. It's insulated to keep the heat in, and if you have a lid on it, it keeps the heat in even more. Coffee cup is a nice, simple calorimeter that we use on a daily basis. Here's what a simple calorimeter looks like. You've got a coffee cup. In order to make it more insulated, maybe you can double wall this. Because when we do that lab that is coming up on Wednesday, you want to design a calorimeter that will release or gain as much heat as possible. There's a known mass of water inside the calorimeter. And we know that one milliliter of water is the same as one gram. So if I know the volume of water, of distilled water that is, I'll know the mass of the water as well. We place a hot piece of metal into that water and we'll know the grams of that. The heat will flow from the metal to the water, causing the temperature of the water to rise. That's why we'll use a thermometer to figure out the change of temperature of that water. The only piece missing from this diagram is a stirring rod. And it's nice to agitate the system so you can spread the heat all throughout the water faster and get a more precise reading of the change in temperature of the water and thereby the heat transferred from the metal to the water itself. So in calorimetry, the study of heat transfer, we measure the amount of heat transferred to water. Now we could do it for any types of other substances put inside of a calorimeter. In fact, this is kind of the same system we use to figure out how many calories are in food. However, in physics, we're gonna figure out how much heat is transferred when I put hot metal into cold water. So calorimeter is a nice example of the law of conservation of energy. If I've got a closed system, where no energy is going to be released into the surroundings, the heat gained by the water is going to be the heat lost by the substance. And the substance in this case is going to be our metal. Filling in the equations for the law of conservation of energy or for specific heat that I had given you before, we'll know the mass of water times the specific heat of the water times the temperature of the water, the change thereof, is going to equal to and be opposite of the mass of the metal, the specific heat of the metal, and the change in the temperature of the metal. And I can figure out using that equation how much heat is transferred from the metal to the water. Let's look at an example of this. So a piece of metal weighing 59.047 grams was heated to 100 degrees Celsius and then put into 100 milliliters of water. Initially, the water was at 23.7 degrees. The metal and the water were allowed to come to an equilibrium temperature determined to be 27.8 degrees Celsius. Assuming no heat lost to the environment, calculate the specific heat of the metal. Notice here that I made a nice little chart that is going to enable us to figure out what measurements we start out with. So let's look at the metal first. We want to find the specific heat of the metal. 
If we know the specific heat of the metal, we can actually identify that metal. We know the change in temperature of the metal because the metal started off at 100 degrees Celsius and it changed to 27.8 degrees Celsius. And so that's going to be a change of 72.2 degrees Celsius. We know the mass of the metal is 59.047 grams. And we know the specific heat of water. Now, back on my table, again, notice that all of my specific heats were in joules per kilogram. Well, I'm going to change the specific heat to joules per gram because the mass of my metal is in grams. So I'm going to take the 4,186 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius and change that to 4.186 joules per gram degrees Celsius. That's going to always be my specific heat of water when the mass of the substance is in grams. Change in temperature of the water is going to start at or end at 27.8 degrees Celsius and begin at, scrolling up, 23.7. Celsius, and that's going to get me a change of 4.1 degrees Celsius. And the mass of the water is easy to find because since I have 100 milliliters of water, I'm going to have 100 grams of water. So now what I see here is an equation to figure out my specific heat of my metal. I'm going to rearrange this equation to isolate specific heat of the substance, in this case the metal. I'm going to divide both sides by the mass of the metal negative, the change in temperature of the metal. of the metal cancels out, and I'm left with mass of the water, specific heat of the water, change in temperature of the water, all divided by negative mass of the metal, change in temperature of the metal, and I'm going to multiply or uh, make that all equal to the specific heat of whatever metal I'm trying to find. So, my mass of my water was 100. Specific heat of water is 4.186. Change in temperature of my water should have increased in temperature and it went up by 4.1 degrees Celsius. All divided by negative. Mass of my metal is 59.047. And change the temperature of my metal. And I'm going to make this negative because the temperature actually went down. And because when I put the hot metal into the cold water, my final temperature should have been less than my initial temperature. So this is going to be a negative amount since my temperature actually decreased. My specific heat of the metal, plugging this all into my calculator, 100 times 4.186 times 4.1 divided by 59.047 multiplied by 72.2. Negatives cancel out. I find I get a specific heat of point four oh three joules per gram degree Celsius. 
looking at all of my data here, I need to round to the correct number of sig figs. Correct number of sig figs here is two, so 0 0.40 joules per gram degrees Celsius, or one, two, three, 400 joules per gram Celsius. The correct sig figs, 4.0 to the second joules per gram degrees Celsius kilograms degrees Celsius. And I changed that to kilograms because if I remember back on my table, I can use that value to identify the metal. And since my values were somewhere between 390 and 450, I can ascertain that the identity of my metal has to be some alloy that contains iron and steel and maybe some copper in there somewhere. So it's either iron, steel, or copper, which would be the identity of my metal. So hopefully that information is going to help you and enable you to practice page 316, numbers 1 through 4. If that example that I gave you was unclear, the example on page 315 is pretty clear as well. And we are going to spend some time working through those problems tomorrow in class. Have a lovely day.